Hey everyone, Eric here. Just before we get to today's show, I want to let you know that we're offering our podcast listeners a special 20% lifetime discount to the China Africa Daily Brief. Now that's the newsletter that Cobus and I produce every day that provides the most comprehensive digest of everything China's doing on the continent and now increasingly throughout the global south. In addition to the newsletter, you'll also get full archive access to the website and the China Africa Experts Network as well. To get that discount, just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe and use the promo code podcast at checkout. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to return to the debt issue. There's a lot of movement going on right now in a number of different countries. Uh, lots of headlines. Let me bring everybody up to date on some things that have happened just this week alone. China's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, he wrapped up a four-nation tour of Persian Gulf and Sub-Saharan African countries, and he wrapped it up in Zambia and Lusaka, where he met with President Edgar Lungu. Boy, the readout from Xinhua earlier this week detailed all of the things that they talked about, none of which had to do with debt, which is very surprising given the fact that the IMF, private creditors, and the Chinese are all in negotiations right now in Lusaka about the debt. The key question in Lusaka, of course, is the political future of Edgar Lungu and whether or not he's going to make some of the painful choices that need to be done in order to bring the country's debt under control. Also in Kenya, the National Treasury revealed that coming this summer, in the beginning of the new fiscal year, the government is going to cross the psychologically important barrier of one trillion shillings. That's nine billion dollars in debt servicing fees that's coming up. Now, this is very interesting because the debt to GDP ratio in Kenya still remains at a reasonable 65 percent or so. But 57 percent of all tax revenue collected in the country now is going to debt servicing. And a lot of that money is going to China but let's be very clear here, and it's very important that we break down, because in Kenya, there's a lot of confusion about the role of Chinese debt. A lot of people think, A, China is the largest creditor, which it's not. The multilateral agencies are still number one. Number two, China is the largest bilateral creditor on that foreign external debt. And about half of Kenya's debt is domestic, half of it is foreign. Let's take a look at some of the figures coming out of Kenya. The Treasury will spend $909 million dollars to service China Exim Bank debt uh, in the year starting July 1st. Now that's going to be a 132% increase compared with the 391 million that they spent in the current fiscal year. Now that jump goes up because $202 million was deferred this year as part of debt relief. And Cobus, that brings up the painful reality that all of the DSSI, that's the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, and all of the debt deferrals that the Chinese have been doing in countries like Angola and Kenya and also in Zambia is just a deferral. It's not a cancellation. So it does free up some money in the short term, but that money, as we're seeing in Kenya, does need to be paid back. Very quickly in Nigeria also, a lot of talk right now about the debt to GDP ratio. Interestingly, loans from China are not the big issue, despite what you hear coming out of the Nigerian House of Representatives, where there's a lot of talk about Chinese debt and Chinese loans and debt trap. We've heard a lot of that over the past year. Fact is, is that the Chinese have only about 3% of Nigeria's total external debt. Uh, somewhere around $8 billion, $9 billion. Most of that is tied, or well, all of it, in fact, excuse me, all of it is tied to projects and it's on a concessional basis. The key issue in Nigeria right now is that they discovered $5.8 billion in undisbursed loans sitting on the books. And so that brings the concern that the debt to GDP ratio in Nigeria is going up when you measure it against actual revenue collected by the government compared to budgeted revenue 
collected by the government. So the actuals oftentimes are much, much lower. And the concern in Nigeria is now that the debts are going up. They've tripled over the past, say, five to six years. And now Nigerians may be in a situation that they're borrowing money just to pay debts. So, Kobus, we do not have a pan-African debt crisis as many people would like to characterize the story. In the news media, we often hear that, and this has been part of the narrative. What we do have is some acute crises in certain countries, in Angola, Kenya, Zambia, Ethiopia, your country in South Africa, and increasingly in Nigeria. The big ones is where a lot of the action is right now. Yes, and this is, of course, happening in the middle of a global economic crunch and also a, a crisis in remittances. Um, you know, and, and it, I mean, it's generally difficult for African governments to to collect taxes, um, but it, it's particularly difficult at this moment. So all of the all of these factors are kind of working together to to make the crisis more grave in some of these countries. It's been a while since we've delved into this issue, so we we tabled it because there were a lot of other topics we wanted to cover, but we thought it was important this week to come back to it. And so we invited Mark Boland, a senior credit research analyst at Red Intelligence in London, to come back on the show. And we're going to do our little tour right through Africa because, Mark, you are a guy who follows this very, very closely. And a very good morning to you from London. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me on again. It's, it's a pleasure. I'll do my best. There's a lot going on. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with everything. Uh, but let's just do your best. What we want to try and do is get a sense of what... You and your colleagues in the financial services industry are seeing and how you may be interpreting some of these issues, which is oftentimes very different than how politicians, scholars, and other analysts, particularly those in the development community, are, are looking at these issues. Let's start with one of your favorites, Angola. I know this is a country that you follow especially close. Where are we right now in Angola? Well, they had the IMF uh, report released in uh, in January uh, with a disbursement uh, around 500, well, I think it was 4 to 500 million, and also uh, some more details on the uh, three-year debt deferment deal that they have uh, agreed with uh, Chinese creditors. Now, were those two linked? Was the IMF deal conditional on the debt deferral deal with the Chinese? Yes, essentially. So if you look at the debt sustainability analysis, it essentially says that Angola's debt is only sustainable thanks to this debt deferment deal. And that is something uh, which uh, is relevant for Ethiopia, which uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, so, yeah, that's the thing. And uh, it's that. So it's, it's essentially a deferment of uh, principal payments. These are... Uh, this is money that will have to be uh, paid back later. And also a special escrow account for the China Development Bank that will have to be replenished in 2023. So it'll essentially help Angola through the next two and a half years. But then you'll have a sharp increase in the debt servicing in uh, in 2023. And then also, you know, this is going to continue over 2024 and 2025 when the first euro bond uh, comes due in November 2025. So it's essentially just kicking the can down the road. And, uh, you know, it is a question of how, you know, is this written in stone? We haven't had that much or really any communication from the Chinese side on this. And I did publish a report in, in January, which uh, our clients have uh, found very interesting on if, you know, if China is, is inching towards accepting an Angolan uh, debt restructuring. And, you know, I think in so far they've they've said no. Well, I mean, we can only speculate if there has been an official request, but so far, you know, what they have been discussing with Angola and Ethiopia is, is a, a, you know, essentially deferring the debt, uh, just kind of extending maturities and the sums of debt that have been forgiven, you know, have been relatively small. We had Rwanda, it was a six million in Rwanda. I mean, these are kind of sums in the tens of millions uh, to countries that in some cases owe billions of dollars or owe billions of dollars to to uh, to China. So it's, it's a question, it's a temporary solution and it's a question for how long it actually will remain sustainable. And, uh, you know, no one, China is not going to force anyone to restructure their debt, but, uh, you know, the decision to restructure the debt is always going to come from the uh, 
from the creditor either because they can't uh, continue to service the debt or also because they don't want to continue to service the debt. And I think the second factor is is something that uh, is also worth keeping in consideration. Do you have any you know indication of, of where this entire process in Angola is going to leave the resource-backed loan as a as a kind of a lending instrument for China? Is is uh, is it safe to say that 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 it may be played out, or do you think it will continue to be useful? I think they are phasing this out. I mean, I guess it's been a way to Angola to continue to borrow money uh, in some. I mean, not just from. China, but I mean, it's it's generally being phased out. The IMF and uh, has been very opposed to this kind of lending, and uh, the Chinese. Okay, now oil is back above sixty dollars per barrel again, but we're still in in a world that's just you know in an oil glut. We're not in the world of of ten years ago when oil was above hundred dollars per barrel. So I think you know China is I think relatively feels a lot more secure in their oil supply than they did 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, because now, I mean, the majority of Middle Eastern oil actually goes to to China now or to, to well, or to Asia now, uh, where, you know, 15, 20 years ago would go to the U.S., which is now self-sufficient in oil. So I think uh, the oil back loans or the commodity back loans are are being phased out. Let's also remember that when we talk about Angola with regards to the Chinese, they have a disproportionate amount of the Chinese debt portfolio in Africa. So if I remember off the top of my head, it's about a third of all Chinese debt in Africa is concentrated in Angola. So for the Chinese lenders, getting Angola right is very, very important. And you will see probably a lot more attention focused on Angola because the stakes are much higher for them there. Let's head up over to Zambia, where I mentioned that Yang Jiechi, China's top diplomat, just wrapped up a visit there. There's a lot of go- lot going on there because of the political situation that's underway. What's your reading right now on Zambia, and what are you telling your clients about that? Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, a lot of the debate has been about the IMF mission. Uh, I think, I mean, normally the IMF would not have, you know, program negotiations, you know, just before an election, because you know the counterpart of the IMF is always the uh, the government, and you know w- there's no point agreeing a multi-year program with a government that could be uh, kicked out in six months' time. But uh, with Zambia, because it is in this uh, G20 common framework process, and that requires uh, some kind of program performance under under a uh, what they call an upper tranche program, which is essentially a program that has financial support in it. And uh, Zambia has not been in one of these programs since 2011. And, you know, in order for this debt restructuring to go ahead, you need to have some program performance uh, in or you know, for that under an IMF program. And, yeah, it's, you could also question to what extent, you know, the IMF are factoring in that shift in power in August elections, which I think probably won't happen. But would pro- if it happened, you know, if the power would shift to opposition, the opposition would be more likely to actually engage with the, with the IMF uh, in, you know, or continue, you know, performance uh, under an IMF program than the actual government. So I think there was a window to agree a program and uh, initial disbursement ahead of the elections. But I think that window has is is very slim now if it hasn't closed altogether because you can say, you know, you see the the uh, government is continuing to continue to finance itself uh, through the Bank of Zambia. You had the uh, removal of the uh, VAT on fuel, and you had other other policy measures which uh, the central bank, or sorry, which the IMF, uh, I, I think, are not going to be happy with. So I think that's where we are. I mean, there's still ongoing ne- negotiations. They're going to continue till early next week, but I think the possibility of having an IMF program in place before the elections are, are currently pretty slim. Uh, you can also question how much IMF, how much program or, you know, performance you'd have under a program before you can initiate the, well, get to a debt relief. 
I mean, I think the uh, negotiations are just going to be drawn out with uh, with creditors, or it's it's going to take time to time to get to uh, you know to a debt restructuring for Zambia. But uh, and ideally, you want this to happen under an IMF program. So that's that's where we are. You know, when last year, when when the the Zambian debt crisis first hit, there was a lot of back and forth. But you know, about the the relative lack of transparency on on the Chinese side, and then you know, kind of lack of of assurance, um, you know, of a level playing field on on Zambia's um, eurobond lender side. Um, how how are those relationships sitting now? Like, did did they Managed, did all these different parties manage to kind of kind of closer to to the same page? Well, my understanding is there hasn't really been an adequate uh, improvement in the uh, transparency. There's still there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty about uh, you know. Well, you have the Chinese the official debt from uh, China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. That's quite clear. But you know the commercial creditors, both Chinese and others, there's still not enough transparency in that field. There's something we're hearing from client that still haven't got anything from that. There was a statement from the uh, Bank of Zambia governor Christopher Mvulu last week that they. Uh, we're reconsidering some of these priority projects uh, that they wanted to continue to continue with and continue to service the debt for, uh, which was also another bugbear of the uh, eurobond creditors. Uh, so I think it's yeah, it's progress, more progress in some fields, not that much progress in other fields. And uh, I think yeah, the IMF program will be very important. So. Uh, Get it best to get that in place as soon as possible. Uh, I think that's the IMF, uh, the commercial, the bondholders also require that or view that as a requirement uh, really to get into negotiations. And now it looks likely that it's it's going to start an IMF program. It's going to start in the second half of the year rather than the first half of the year. But it feels a little bit like the IMF and private creditors are just going to get played here. Because there have been demands after demands after demands for more transparency from the Chinese and from Edgar Lungu. But yet we've seen nothing. And if the optics of what we saw just this week in Lusaka are anything to go by, the Chinese are not putting any pressure on the Lungu administration to be more transparent. So Lungu says, you know what? I'm good with the Chinese. They're not, they're, they're not putting any pressure on me. So you know what? IMF, private creditors, take it or leave it. But... I'm not going to change. I'm not budging. That's what it seems like from the outside looking in, because without any pressure from the Chinese to be more transparent or to push through the deal, he seems in a pretty comfortable spot. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I don't want to speculate what was said between Yang Yixi and uh, and the uh, Zambian authorities, but you've had this boom in crop, copper prices and Zambia posted the... Um, a record current account surplus in uh, fourth quarter last year. So obviously that's given some relief to the government. You know, it's it's they're still and they're financing, you know, the financing uh, themselves through the Bank of uh, Bank of Zambia. Inflation is rising very rapidly still. So it's obviously putting a lot of pressure on the. Uh, on the population, and despite this big current account surplus, the FX reserves are falling. So obviously, people are taking money out of the country. So I think I would agree with that. You know, IMF bondholders might be getting played by uh, by Lungu and the Zambian government, and you know that's one reason they're not getting to a program. Uh, I'm less unsure what the part of uh, of China is in this. I'm. I'm less, yeah, it's possible they are playing with this and they're prioritizing their their access to copper. You know, copper prices are are uh, approaching record levels, but that's speculation. I mean, I think my impression, my impression is the Chinese are, you know, their priority is, you know, they want to participate on, you know, if they are to participate, it's going to be on the same terms as the other creditors. They don't want to be the only ones that are, you know, uh, deferring the debt and taking the hits on the debt. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's move over to Kenya now. Uh, mixed messages coming out of Kenya. So on the one hand, the African Development Bank is forecasting 6.2% economic growth in 2021 in the post-pandemic 
world that we're in, we're kind of almost there, maybe not quite so much, but nonetheless, they are forecasting a pretty strong growth coming out of Kenya. That being said, one of the key issues, as I mentioned at the top of the show and what we featured in our newsletter earlier this week, is about the psychological barrier of one trillion shillings in debt servicing fees being crossed. The National Treasury is talking about pushing up the debt ceiling past nine trillion. So debt financing and debt spending is going up. The amount of tax revenue being spent on that is also going up. And then the concern is that in the external debt portion of the balance that the Chinese have quite a bit, about $6 billion of outstanding debt, there's been some talk about deferrals, but not a whole lot. So where are we in Kenya right now? Yes, I mean, when you mentioned this debt servicing, I mean, that's, I saw this article you posted, that's a measure that takes into account both the interest costs and the principal payment. So the interest tends to be very pretty stable. Most uh, interest tends to be either fixed or, uh, you know, linked to LIBOR. But the principal payments very, very much, I mean, depending on the contract. So you have, there, there are no principal payments uh last year or this year or next year or in 2023 but then there's a on the euro bonds but then there's a big uh, 2 billion euro bond redemption coming due in uh, in 2024 which i think is is one of the major concerns for the uh, government so they talked about a debt reprofiling uh, and i think what they're going to do is to target that uh, buyback it is similar to what uh, what both Benin and Ivory Coast have done in the past few uh, first past few months is you essentially launch a tender offer. You're saying we're going to buy back a certain amount of uh, these bonds, you know, up to 500, 500 million of, uh, say, the 2024 bond or whatever, and, and this is conditional on the successful launch of a of a new bond, a sale of a new bond uh, with a longer maturity. So I think that's what we're going to see in Kenya, they're going to launch an offer to buy back, I don't know if you could say, up to $1 billion of of uh, this 2024 bond because that's a very sharp increase in in uh, uh, Kenya's external debt uh, principal repayments in that year. And then the next one, I think, is not until 2027 and is a smaller, uh, smaller amount. So I think that's what we're going to see. And uh, yeah, I mean, these levels, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, one trillion, I mean, this is, I'm not so much a fan of these psychologically important important levels because, you know, if it's 99995 or one, one trillion, two doesn't really matter too much, really. It's the general level. But I mean, the problem for Kenya is, yes, debt servicing is rising. It's around... I think around 30% of uh, interest uh, interest costs are around 30% of uh, government revenue that compares to uh, 50% in Ghana. So obviously they're in a better place than Ghana. But the problem is, you know, they their government revenue as a percentage of GDP has been dipping at the same time as they are taking on more debt. Uh, I think, you know, they have more access to uh, concessional debt uh, then uh, from World Bank, from other sources, then, uh, then for instance, Ghana. But it's still something they need to address. And, uh, you know, part of it is the Chinese investment. And, you know, some of it hasn't given, having the same, haven't had the sort of promised economic benefits as a standard gauge railway, but it's also the uh, political devolution, the kind of a new, uh, new tier of government, the county governments that has been created and cost around 3% of GDP uh, per year, which has entirely been entirely debt financed rather than revenue finance, and they need to change that. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the the role of the ratings agencies in all of this. I remember last year when the DSSI from the G20 was first, first mentioned, Kenya expressed worry about joining it f- because they were worried about being downgraded. Now we've seen that Fitch has warned that some countries um, might be downgraded for, for joining the common framework. Um, and I, I saw, yeah, again, kind of Kenya kind of coming up in some of those conversations. Like, w- What is the role of the ratings agencies in in all of this? Yeah, so last year was mainly Moody's that put a few countries, well, it was Moody's, only Moody's that put a few countries on 
on uh, uh, watch for negative downgrade uh, because they were participating in the DSSI and they viewed there being a, you know, essentially that the risk of uh, there being a private sector involvement in, in this was higher or more important than the tangible liquidity relief, uh, essentially the benefit from uh, from uh, bilateral debt servicing being uh, uh, being suspended that, you know, that the uh, risk of private sector involvement was larger. But, I mean, this ended with no country was actually downgraded on uh, because of taking part of the uh, taking part in the DSSI. Uh, there were countries, um, I'm trying to remember, Cameroon, or there were some countries that actually got downgraded at the end of this progress, but it was on other grounds, not the DSSI participation. But the G20 common framework is different from uh, from the DSSI and I mean it is a a process that is I mean it is a debt restructuring uh, which will lead to some kind of reprofiling of the debt that you know might not be labeled by a distressed debt, debt exchange or something but I mean it's it's very much uh, you know in how you know the tradition of uh, of uh, debt rating agencies to, uh, I mean, and it is actually their job to, you know, to actually look after this and view this as a, as, you know, something that is being imposed on the, uh, on the creditors and these rating agencies, they, they rate the private sector debt. I mean, it's worth remembering that, that that's the risk that they, they assess and that's what they, how they make the money. So I think the, Maybe you could accuse that Moody's was just kind of going through the motions, just, you know, that it was quite clear from the beginning that they weren't going to um, downgrade anyone just because they participated in, in the DSSI. But I think the G20 common framework is is another kettle of fish. And I definitely, yeah, I, I would, you know, you've got to view it as an increase, a material increase in the risk that, that the private sector debt will be negatively affected. It's interesting you bring that up because Fitch wrote a note because there was a lot of confusion over the G20 Common Framework Plan and why the ratings agencies were issuing downgrades because countries wanted to participate in it. They explained that they said if there's a reprofiling of public debt, that the agencies would not actually downgrade for that. It was the private creditor debt as part of the common framework restructuring that prompted the downgrades. Uh, Interestingly enough, Ethiopia, which is the next country on our list that we're going to, earlier this month in February was downgraded by both S&P and Fitch. And in one of the reasons that they both gave was because of the participation in the G20 common framework. The other issue in Ethiopia is the economic impact of the internal conflict in Tigray. Can you talk to us about the situation in Ethiopia? We have not heard much about the Chinese there and any discussions that are going on. So any insights you might have on the Chinese conversations would be also very interesting. Well, I mean, Ethiopia was in negotiation with some of the, some of its largest bilateral creditors. I mean, China, definitely. It's not clear if uh, India and Turkey, which are the second largest bilateral creditors, do... Uh, to Ethiopia were participants in this negotiations for a multi-year uh, debt deferment, similar to what you know what China and Angola have agreed. But those negotiations were ongoing in the second half of last year, when the conflict in, in Tigray started in, in November, if I uh, remember correctly. And I put out a note for Red Intelligence when you know things started heating up and saying essentially that the the uh, you know the most serious implications of the conflict for a conflict for uh, Ethiopia's sovereign debt would be through the balance of payments and you know the World Bank inflows uh, primarily uh, le- more than the actual uh, Chinese debt payments um, that they had due and uh, you know that's you know you've had suspension of aid from EU from others you know as a result of this conflict it was quite unsurprising and uh, you know so it's in a way it's you know i think you know the timing and the communication of the um, you know that they were seeking uh, seeking treatment under this g20 com- common framework i mean took a lot of people by surprise but if you actually look at it it's maybe not 
that surprising. Uh, you know, essentially, they're not. It's going to be very difficult to maintain the World Bank budget support when you know there is a conflict going on with alleged human rights abuses in the Tigray. But at the same time, if you look at the, I mean, the eurobond has sold off the 2024 eurobond, but it's still trading at eight nine percent, uh, which kind of indicates that there is, if there's any change to that, it'll be relatively light uh, rather than a, rather than a sharper sharper default, and I think that is is generally correct. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at the Wits University Journalism Department in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za. This is this is somewhat wider question than Ethiopia, um, but I was wondering where we're standing at the moment um, with calls for the IMF to to issue special special drawing rights, um, particularly, um, you know, seeing that that the you know it, it, there was a lot of resistance against it in the Republican Party in the U.S. And I was wondering whether whether the change over you know to the Biden administration is changing that. Yes, I mean I put out a report last autumn in September saying you know this is the this is the bargain, you know, the uh, G7 want to, you know, they're pushing for the DSSI because that essentially puts all the burden of very much, the majority of the burden of debt, you know, debt relief on China because it's the biggest bilateral creditor by far. While China wanted to, or were pushing for the SDRs uh, because that would pump out, you know, pump out a lot of money through the IMF and, you know, help a lot of these countries service their debt, uh, you know, and, you know, that was why, you know, the well, that is still why uh, the Republican Party is opposed to this SDR uh, issue is just a claim it's just a bailout for, for all these bad Chinese loans to all these countries. But, I mean, it looks like it is happening. I think it was always likely to happen if there was a shift in the uh, U.S. administration. Uh, you know, the different sums being involved. There's a, I think it's, a, it's around 600 billion or so. There's a, a ceiling for how much, uh, how much uh, the US administration can uh, push through without having to, uh, having to consult or having, having a vote in both houses. But I think generally, the is, you know, in general view, or my general view is that it, Will not be transformational. It'll be trans. Will be a have a big impact on very few countries. One of those is actually interesting, uh, Zambia. Well, I, I shouldn't say transformational, but it will actually boost Zambia's uh, FX reserves by I think I've heard fifty to seven seventy percent. I mean they're very running very low on their FX reserves. So, uh, but I mean I think essentially it's. It just buys time. It doesn't solve the uh, fundamental problems in these countries. So you could just say it's it's just a band aid. It doesn't actually deal with the uh, uh, with a deeper situation with the problems. But I, I think it's I think it's gonna go ahead and buy a bit of time and maybe help to give a bit more time to deal with the more sun- fundamental issues in these countries. I'm not sure if I share your optimism, and I will defer to you that you have far greater insights into this issue than I do, but the mood in Washington, D.C. right now is that if Biden wants to fight for the special drawing rights to be pushed through the IMF, he's going to have to pay a political price on Capitol Hill. This isn't going to come for free, because the concern among conservatives and Republicans is that the special drawing rights means that every country gets cash— unrestricted cash. That means Iran gets cash, Venezuela gets cash, China gets cash. And those are the rivals of the United States. And conservatives have made it very, very clear that they see this as a blank check for the Chinese to be able to do what they want. And I'm just not sure. I mean, here's a a Wall Street Journal opinion column from French Hill, who is a Republican congressman. And it gives you the tone a little bit of what the mood is in Washington. He writes, lavishing SDRs on developing world borrowers would make restructuring or forgiveness of Chinese government loans less likely, giving Beijing the green light to proceed with business as usual in a post-pandemic world. No wonder Yi Gang, governor of China's central bank, has championed the cause of issuing more SDRs 
from the IMF. So this has been the holdup of the uh, the SDRs from the beginning. And Kobus, if you recall, very early on in the crisis, you and I spoke with Vera Songwei, and one of the things that she called for was the issuance of SDRs. And we heard that from finance minister after finance minister after finance minister across Africa, that liquidity from the IMF was key to solving this. But Kobus, you have written extensively in our newsletter and on our website about how U.S. politics, domestic U.S. politics, continues to get in the way of these economic relief programs. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, from from the from the perspective of the global South, I think that that is that is problematic. You know, the, that that it comes down to domestic political issues within the U.S. rather than some kind of comprehensive you know, plan for for the developing world. Um, Mark, what, what do you think? Like, do, do, do you think that, that, that it, it, you know, that the, this kind of political um, pressure will actually ma- make it impossible to, to move it forward on this issue? Yeah, I mean, you probably know, I've seen the headlines, I've seen the articles. I mean, you probably know the US Congress better than, than I do. I mean, I think I view it as as, as kind of a a compromise between the DSSI, which, you know, China is opposed to, you know, further extensions of that because, you know, they think, you know, they're taking all the costs from and, you know, countries that are very much richer than them, Japan and, the, you know, other are, are not actually contributing that much to this. You know, they're, they're essentially they as a, OK, I don't know, if, you know, as if they're still viewed as a developing country, but obviously their GDP per capita is very much lower than uh, Japan and U.S., that they are kind of fronting most of the bur- burden or taking most of the burden for uh, for helping out these uh, these countries in Africa and other places. So I think, you know, what my kind of core scenario is uh, a smaller SDR, SDR uh, uh, issuance with, you know, Possibly in, in you know in exchange for another six month extension of the DSSI, which is coming up now to be discussed in in April. But I mean, it's not going to be transformative for any country. It's not. It's only going to be important for a small number of countries in Africa. You know, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, possibly DR Congo, from some of the numbers I've seen. Uh, but I think that is the view. And then you know is. You know, also Yi Gang suggested. I mean, there are suggestions that you know the richer country or the countries with bigger, uh, bigger uh, IMF quotas are going to kind of pool their, pool their money into some fund, which is going to you know they're on lending and lend on that money to the, uh, uh, to the poorer countries that actually have smaller get a smaller increase in this uh, uh, SDR issuance, and that could make it more important. But uh, that's still very early and, you know, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, round out our conversation in Nigeria. I mentioned at the top of the show, Nigeria has, again, a mixed picture here because it's an oil-based economy. Oil is up at $60 a barrel, as you talked about. There is a recovery coming. It's very likely that if the wealthy economies in U.S., Europe, Japan, and China rebound next year in a post-pandemic world. If they get their economies going, the demand for oil is going to go up considerably, so that will help Nigeria quite a bit. Uh, That being said, from 2014 to 2020, Nigeria's debts tripled from 11 trillion naira to about 32 trillion naira. And again, there's this another 10 trillion that just we found out about just this week that's sitting on the debt management office's books in that sense where they're tracking it uh, for about $5.8 billion. So again, Chinese loans are not the key issue in Nigeria, but Nigeria being the largest economy in Africa, it sets a mood for the rest of the continent. What are you looking at in Nigeria right now? Yeah, I mean, oil is going to go up and down. I don't know if I'm as optimistic on the longer term view of of oil prices, but I think, you know, that you're not going to have the kind of oil boom uh, you had 10, 15 years in in, uh, in Nigeria and you just didn't have, well, you know, oil revenue wasn't increasing as much as, you know, money, you know, the population of Nigeria to kind of import the band. And what I think is underreported in uh, in Nigeria or from Nigeria is the kind of what they call the restructuring effort, which has not got well, not nothing to do with uh, with debt restructuring. It's the so political debt restructuring is essentially shifting more money, more revenue to the uh, state governments. And these, you know, ten, fifteen years ago, you would have, you know, under Olusegun, 
or Bassanio, you'd have a lot of the political power was concentrated in the uh, in the presidency, and you know they could run a pretty tight ship, and that was you know why. No, they were building up reserves for a lot of the early 2000s, even though for most of that period, oil was around $50, $60 per barrel. It's under Charles Saludo at the Central Bank in Nigeria. But now this oil revenue is, is well, political power is, is more spread. And, you know, they have, you have the Federal Board of Governors, which is now one of the most important political institutions in the country, maybe not, you know, directly in in uh, in managing in the executive, but it's uh, definitely very important for uh, if you want to get elected uh, as president. And I think this, this political restructuring is going to come back into focus as the uh, next elections approach, and the next president is going to have to close deals with uh, with these uh, important governors to win the support for them. Uh, leading well, the presidential candidate is going to have to kind of strike strike deals with these. Uh, important state governors in order to win their support ahead of the elections and you essentially have the the clash of you know more money you know pol- politics pushing more money into to the state governments while the federal government actually needs more money to service the debt and you know, something's got to give and uh, you know quite well for the last decade or so you know economics is one over politics but i think this could be a case where politics wins over economics and that is you know why i you know now you're actually seeing the possibility of a nigerian default being priced increased well i mean the nigeria's credit ratings have dipped and they're actually reflecting a, a higher a degree of a of a debt restructuring and you know it's not a near-term prospect but i think you know it is heading in that direction and it's hard to say what's you know what's going to turn the ship around how much uh, progress is nigeria making in in moving beyond oil as the central driver of its economy and and, and what's the kind of debt implications of of making that shift i wouldn't say they're making much progress at all uh, i mean they're um well, you have the debt refinery coming, uh, the Dangota's debt refinery, which is quite an impressive project. But I mean, this is in a, in a three, you know, three hundred billion economy. I saw from a colleague of mine, a Bloomberg Opinion, you know, said that Nigeria is going to become the next next manufacturing hub of Africa. But I don't know if he actually was aware how difficult it's to get, but well, electricity, moving things across the border, and getting any foreign exchange when he. Uh, when he made this prediction, uh, I think he was shifted it to being Ghana, being the manufacturing hub of uh, of uh, Africa. Uh, a few months later, so we'll see. I just don't think uh, we haven't really made any progress. I mean, there's uh, yeah. I mean, Nigeria is so big that it can actually, in contrast to to uh, a lot of other countries in Africa, it doesn't actually need to export in order to achieve the sort of economies of scale and specialization to drive uh, non-oil growth. But you know, for, you know, for these reasons I mentioned, it's it's not happening. And and I think Buhari in that area is it's it's been a regression rather than uh, any progress. You know, you're not you haven't solved the. Uh, the power situation is still as bad. You have the, uh, you know, FX limitations. You have the, uh, you know, the border closures and anything. So, fortunately, Nigeria is, is moving in the wrong direction. Let's close out our discussion reflecting back to the beginning of the COVID-19 economic crisis, not necessarily the public health crisis, because in Africa it's been primarily an economic crisis. When you look back at what the Chinese role in all of this is in the debt restructuring, the participation in the G20s, DSSI, some of the debt deferrals. How would you assess their role? Are they helping or are they hurting the situation or a mix of both? Well, I mean, it was clear before COVID. I mean, it's been clear for years. And I mean, this is what Michael Pettis, a scholar on China, has said, you know, that the Chinese overseas lending just follows the, you know, the pattern of every, you know, country that's kind of started lending 
uh, aggressively overseas is you know quite soon you run into problems just because you're you know you're lending to a lot of projects that other people aren't lending to for quite good reasons so and you know it's clear that these projects would run into problems and you know the FOCAC 2018 uh, in uh, was in Beijing just you know tried to deal with this mess some initial steps and you know they set up the uh, overseas uh, development corporation and you know start saying you know we're going to make we're going to have a clearer definition of what is policy based lending and what is commercial lending because those lines were just crossed and a lot of lending was just very easy just sourced you know if you're a big chinese corporate uh, you just source the project in africa you know with some willing african president or anything and you just got the stamp from the uh, ministry of commerce in, in beijing and then you got your china and bank loan and then you know these companies you know they they cared about the revenue they got whether this project was economically sustainable a very good project was was just a second thought and now the uh, chinese are dealing with this and uh, uh, I think you know they still want to maintain the uh, the ties with uh, a lot of African countries. Still see them as as allies and uh, still view you know wants wants to be seen as as Africa's friends. And that's why I think you know they will be forthcoming when it comes to extending debt relief for a, you know or extending maturities. And I think it's going to be more pro troublesome to get the uh, the private sector on board. And uh, I mean, that's where the common framework comes into place. And, you know, you're going to need legislation uh, in primarily UK to essentially oblige the uh, the private sector to uh, participate in this. And, uh, you know, it wants the common framework, and, you know, once you have that, it's I think it's going to be hard to uh, to actually deny countries, African countries that want to restructure the debt. Uh, access to the common framework, whether that debt is is viewed as as uh, sustainable or not, and um, but that we can we can discuss that in, a, in another podcast. Yes, we're, we'll let you get back onto your day. We do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule this morning to join us. Mark Boland is a senior credit research analyst at Red Intelligence in London. Mark, you are a regular Twitter. You tweet all the day, and uh, you have a lot of great things. What's the best way for people to find you on Twitter? Yes, it's Mark Boland. So I would say I retweet a few things per day uh, rather than uh, uh, putting a lot of original content. So <laughs> well, I don't want to get you in trouble with your boss that you're tweeting all day. <laughs> but listen, Mark, thank you so much. We'll put a link to your Twitter feed in the show notes, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and explain it all out. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was taking a little bit of a detour from our discussion with Mark to talk about vaccines, but there is, a, a, to me, a parallel between the way that wealthy countries have been dealing with Africa on vaccines and also on debt. All last year, one of the things that I was complaining about more, I think a, a little bit less passionately than you were, but the fact is that there is so much more that the United States, that Britain and Japan and China could do to alleviate the debt situation, whether it's the IMF issuance of new special drawing rights, whether it's some of the reform of legislation for the sovereign wealth funds and the private creditors to ease up their fiduciary burdens so that they can do negative debt relief and restructuring. Right now, they're bound by law that they can't, but again, the laws can change if they wanted to, but there just seems to be a collective lack of will from those in the global north to those in the global south. And that is something that parallels what we've been seeing also in the vaccine issue as well. You've been writing about this all week in our newsletter saying how basically, you know, they're just letting they're letting Africa and other developing regions in the global south just kind of fend for themselves. And throughout this entire debt restructuring, debt relief process, and this is something that David Malpass, who's the president of the World Bank, keeps coming back to time and time again. There's been no reduction of the overall debt stock. And until the debt stock actually goes down, the burden on, say, Kenyan taxpayers, South African taxpayers remains. And so you can defer the debts. You can kick them down the road. But as we're seeing in Kenya, you're going to have to pay at some point. And one thing that we've learned from the Chinese is at this point, 
they do not write off large amounts of their commercial or their concessional debt other than their interest-free grants, which is about 1% to 2% of their overall debt portfolio in a place like Africa. So it's hardball politics right now between the Global North creditors and those borrowers in Africa. And right now, it seems like Africans are continuing to lose. It's it's very dismaying. You know, the, I, I think what, one of one of the problems we, we have a, we have a bunch of kind of existential, like massive problems. One of which is that that for a, a lot of for for example for the growth um, dividends of something like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement to to kick in, one needs so much infrastructure to in order to get stuff across borders um, once that infrastructure is in you know the, the the effect will be will be quite quick but getting them in you know is, is really expensive um, so I think one really needs creative kind of blue sky thinking in terms of, of designing new mechanisms to fund these these um, the you know these kind of expansions like the the, the current debt um, system does it doesn't seem to be working and, and you know it's, it's it kind of buys Africa more and more problems down the road. And, you know, even if, if one is a, a kind of a hard-nosed global northerner, then one might be like, well, you know, sad. But the the, 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 the reality is is that, the you know, the, the more these problems are not solved in Africa, the more they spill over everywhere else. Um, it's not it's not sustainable for a place like Europe to have Africa be this poor and this have be this undeveloped. Um, you know, in, in the long term, uh, you know, a prospering Africa will be much, much, much better for, for a place like Europe. So, you know, so, so, so being creative, and, and finding ways of solving these problems is really crucial. Well, there are some homegrown solutions that are coming out of the African Union. Raila Odinga this week announced a new African Union infrastructure fund. Odinga, who is the Kenyan politician, is also the infrastructure chief at the AU. And this is very interesting because what he's calling on African sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, retirement funds, those pools of money that exist in Africa, mainly in places like Nigeria and South Africa, he's calling for them to contribute 5% of those funds to an African infrastructure fund that will be separately managed. And this kind of then starts coming into Vera Songwe at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa about bundling together resources in Africa and then creating them into new special purpose vehicles that can either then be collateralized and sold into the global debt markets or can be repurposed and repackaged in any number of different ways. But some very interesting financing solutions coming up that may be coming out of necessity because Chinese financing appears to be drying up, at least from the two major policy banks, the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. A cautionary tale this week came out of Latin America. Last year, in 2020, overseas development finance of energy projects went down to zero. Not one dollar was spent from the Chinese in Latin America on energy projects. First time in five years that that happened. Very, very interesting that that's taking place. So I encourage you to look at what's happening in other parts of the world to see what may actually be happening in Africa and other parts of the global south. Cobus, as we look forward in 2021, Again, we're getting these mixed signals where a number of African economies, including Ghana and Kenya, are forecast for some very, very strong growth that may be that because they're coming off of a small base, but nonetheless, a really great story on the growth side. But we still have this overhang of debt and the role of the Chinese in the debt process. What are you seeing in, in this year while they're still grappling with the pandemic? It's going to be fascinating. Um, you know, the the growth. The, I think the growth will, will be closely tied to to um, demand for certain African commodities in places like China, and um, particularly as the Chinese um, economy fully comes comes back online. Um, I think you know, like also in relation to to the the innovative um, lending instruments that you mentioned before. I think what's going to be really important for Africa from this year onwards is not only to to develop these innovative instruments. Instruments, but also to start thinking a lot more collectively about about shared growth and shared development, you know, because one one of the problems I think in Africa is that the, is that despite something like the the Continental Free Trade Agreement, thinking in Africa is still very very strongly along state lines, and you frequently see countries competing with each other when they should be developing complementarities instead, and I think that's going to be a real challenge. It's going to be you know kind of the the challenge isn't 
isn't only to the international community or to or to the African financial community. It's also to the political culture within Africa to try and find ways of working together in ways that that kind of you know floats all of the boats. Um, you know, and I, and I think that that's going to be yeah that that's a, that's a real hurdle. Well, two housekeeping notes before we end our program today. First. For those of you who are participating in Clubhouse, which is the social audio platform, want to let you know that Kobus and I are planning on doing uh, Clubhouse chats on all these issues, just kind of like the Ask Me Anythings, the open talks, and we just want to hear from you and have a discussion with you. We're also going to do some chats with Kaiser Guo from the Seneca podcast about China and the Global South. We're going to kick those off in the next week or so, maybe two weeks. So get your Clubhouse accounts up. Look for us on Clubhouse. We're going to be working within the Inside Asia channel. So that's going to be where we are. They have about 33,000 followers on that channel. It's a really dynamic channel. And so we're really excited to be a part of of that channel. So look for us on the Inside Asia channel. Get your Clubhouses going. We're going to do some in the time zones that are convenient for those of you in the East Coast of the United States. And the mornings out here in Asia, terrible for you, Cobus. But you and I, Cobus, will do a couple others that are more convenient for our friends in Europe and in Africa. So that's number one. Number two, if you've been on the sidelines about getting a subscription to the China Africa Project daily email newsletter that Cobus and I put out, this is a great time. We've got a new promotion where we're giving away a 20% discount on a lifetime subscription. So year after year after year, if you're a happy subscriber, you'll get a discount of 20%. Uh, just go to China. ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Enter the promo code podcast and you'll get that 20% discount. This newsletter is something we're super proud of and we're just so excited by the reaction that it's been getting from people in government, in business, in academia. And we would love for you, our listeners on the show, especially those of you who have made it all the way to the end of the program. You are our most loyal listeners. We think that if you've made it this far in the show, you of all people will love a subscription to the Daily Email Newsletter. Also, by the way, it gives you full access to all the archives on the website. We're producing about eight to 10 stories a day. So we're really chronicling the minutia of the China-Africa, China-Global South relationship, which becomes a fantastic research tool uh, when you tap into our archives. So go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. That'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. We'll be back again next week with another edition. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobus at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project, and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com.